Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to those of you in the room. Welcome to those of you online. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Frank Hanna back to the Bush School. Um, Frank is CEO of Hanna Capital in Atlanta, Georgia. He invests as a merchant banker in technology and financial services, has started and sold a number of businesses over the past 31 years. Uh, prior to going into the investment business, was a corporate attorney, and he's featured in a documentary on PBS called The Call of the Entrepreneur. Um, Frank has been involved in education for the last 37 years. Um, he was a founding member of the Bush School Board of Visitors, actually the founding member, because you were the very first, if you remember. Um, and he's been instrumental in the, the foundation of 12 other educational institutions from preschool to all the way through post-secondary and was chair of the Commission on Education Excellence under President George W. Bush. Um, currently serves on and advises on the boards of numerous nonprofit organizations, both within the Catholic Church and secular, in the secular world, including EWTN, the Acton Institute, and the American Enterprise Institute. He was awarded the William B. Simon Prize for Philanthropic Leadership and the David R. Jones Award for Philanthropic Leadership. He's also a Knight of Malta, a Knight of the Holy Sepulchre, and was named a Knight of the Grand Cross of the Order of St. Gregory by Pope Benedict XVI. And is author, author of two best-selling books, uh, What Your Money Means and A Graduate Life Guide to Life, and we'll be talking about both of these today. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Frank Hanna. Thank you. So, Frank, welcome. It's great, great to have you here. It's um, wonderful to be here. So, so you, you were board member number one of our board of visitors. You're now a trustee of the university. Yeah. You've also been a great mentor to me personally. So, uh, we always have great discussions, whether it's on the phone or, or over lunch. So, I, before COVID, I would fly down to Atlanta. Uh, we got a mass together at Christ the King Cathedral down there. The Cathedral, that's right. And then across the street, there's a great steakhouse, and we go have a nice steak. Uh, lunch and, and Frank would give me all kinds of coaching and advice on how to be a good dean and how to build this uh, great business school and make it make it even better. So I thought it would be interesting to the students to hear some of those conversations. Sorry, I can't offer you a steak lunch right now, um, but we eat steak. I eat salmon, but uh, that's right. For you to me, I could say it on that steak. So, yeah. um, so let's begin here. So, so I, I tell some of my students about this. So I, I know they're keen to hear. I am too. One of the most unique things you have done, to my mind, um, in a very interesting life, is you bought, as I understand it, the oldest existing written copy of the Our Father, right? Yeah. And then you donated it to the Vatican. Yeah. Um, I, I want to know, how old was it? What gave you that idea? And then how did you get it to the Vatican? Well, it, it, I'll tell you, it, can you all hear okay? Is it echoing or does it sound okay? Okay, great, great. It echoes inside my, my space capsule here. <laughs> um, I'll tell you this, first of all, Andrew, and this is something I think for, for, for all of you out there to be aware of. I didn't think of this, this idea. This came to me. Somebody called me out of the blue and said, Frank, I know you've been very involved with the church. Um, we're working with the Vatican because they're trying to acquire the oldest copy of the Lord's Prayer in the world. It's an ancient papyrus. Would you be interested? And uh, I kind of knew that a papyrus had something to do with the origination of paper, but I, I, I didn't know a lot about uh, biblical antiquity. I didn't know much about antiquity at all. I didn't know much about papyrus, but I thought, well, well, that's intriguing. And so sort of one thing led to another. I got a call from the... Uh, the Papal Muncio to the U.S. You know, saying Pope Benedict is, is, is very interested in this, and this is an essential part of the history of the church. And the more I learned about it, what, what I realized, and one reason Pope Benedict was so interested in this, uh, this is a papyrus date, the date's between 175 and 225 A.D. This thing's 18, 1900 years old. And it wasn't found until the 50s in some clay jars in Egypt by a peasant. And it was in a library in Switzerland. They were having to sell it because they were having to raise money for their, for their collection. And scholars around the world were concerned that a private party might buy this piece of civilization and religious history and just keep it for themselves. So the Vatican was very interested. Can we 
and we get this and save it in a place where it will be available to the church and to, to all of civilization forever, and we can protect it the way they do with ancient manuscripts. So, and I didn't know anything about this, but this guy calls and I'm thinking, well, yes, I mean, I can, I'll go listen to what, what they're saying. Um, and, and one thing leads to another, and then all of a sudden we find out that we're, we're, we're purchasing this. The day it was purchased in Switzerland, they, they surrounded the, the nunciature where it was, uh, where, where it was bought, you know, with the Swiss army. The next day, they closed down the airport, flew it to Rome, it got to Rome. They bring it in with a helicopter overhead and surrounded by uh, uh, police cars right into the, you know, it, many people know where the Vatican Museum is, but there's a Vatican archives next to the museum and library, library and archives right next to the museum. And, and so this is stored in the library. The reason this piece is so important, it is the oldest copy of the Lord's Prayer. It's also the oldest copy of two gospels together. So where the Gospel of Luke ends and the Gospel of John begins, you can see it, it literally ends in the middle of the page and then the next, next part of the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what's intriguing, though, is the oldest complete Bible that we have in civilization dates to about 325 A.D. Two of them. One's called the Codex Sinaiticus in the British Museum. One's called the Codex Vaticanus. The Vatican holds the Codex Vaticanus. And most of our the, the Bibles all over the world are based on the Codex Vaticanus. It dates to 325 AD. So those who want to criticize the Bible say, well, all this Bible you got dates to 325. How can you Christians be so confident that something that dates to 325 that it stayed, that the integrity of it stayed, stayed uh, true to what actually happened? So now come along in the 1950s, and we find a papyrus that predates that oldest Bible we have by 100 to 150 years. So the question becomes, is it going to match? And there was a guy doing his biblical PhD who actually, his name was Cardinal Martini. There were two people who were rumored who might become Pope when John Paul II died. One was Cardinal Ratzinger, who became the Pope. The other was Cardinal Martini. And he did his biblical thesis, and he compared and this papyrus is found, the markings on it, the Codex Vaticanus. And it, it, it matches up almost exactly. So what it shows is for 100 to 150 years, whoever was copying this was making sure, look, this is sacred. we got to stay very true to it. And so in the end, it becomes something that, that helps the authenticity of our faith, because it helps show what the... But, but candidly, for, for me and my family, it just ended up being one of the most wonderful blessings we ever had at, this was not something we sought out. And so I, I guess what I want to encourage all of you for, it's one of the greatest blessings of my life. It just kind of took listening to someone who called me out of the blue and opening my mind to be, maybe get involved with something that was not part of my plan. Uh, but I think it was part of God's plan because we, it ended up playing out beautifully. Um, and, uh, and I think that's something, especially in a business school where we all focus on our business plans and our strategies and, and how we bring things to market. And it's, it's remarkable when you study business successes, how many of them, uh, there was the business plan that had things going this way. And then all of a sudden, you know, going through these doors and all of a sudden the window opens over here of opportunity. And the question becomes, can we, can we look through that window and not be so attached and this is where you know one of the christian virtues of detachment we can get so attached to our own business strategy and our own business plan and for me even the things that i'm involved with within the church i'm thinking well i don't do ancient stuff i don't do that for the church i i, I help with catholic schools that's what i do and this guy comes along and says well maybe you should look at this papyrus or something but that's not what that's not what frank does uh, and so it's good to have plans, it's good to have strategies, but, but our ego can get tied up in those. And those plans and strategies, when they become our will, then we get very attached to them and very wedded to them. And sometimes when a, when a window opens up with God saying, hey, maybe you want to look at this, if we're too attached to the plans we've already devised, we're, we're not as likely to be, to, to be open to that opportunity become shining through a window. So it was a wonderful experience for us. Uh, at the very end when we presented it to Pope Benedict, 
my wife and daughter and I are standing there, and he starts, uh, Pope Benedict could read ancient Greek, right? So he starts reading this, he lands in ancient Greek, he starts reading from the prologue of the Gospel of John. If any of you are familiar with your Bibles, in the prologue of the Gospel of John sums up the whole Christian thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He goes on, it's beautiful poetry. If he's reading it, I know it's my daughter, because she was, she was a little girl, we'd learn things like the 23rd Psalm. And then we learned the 27th Psalm, but she got to ninth grade, and I said, let's learn the prologue of the Gospel of John. So on the way to school every day, I'd begin, I'd say, in the beginning was the Word, and she'd say, and the Word was with God. And I'd say, and the Word was God. And we'd go back and forth through the whole first chapter of John. And then here we were two years later, and we're standing there, and the, the Vicar of Christ is, is reading it from the oldest copy of it in the world. So it was, it was beautiful. I didn't mean to go on so long, but it's, it's just a, it's a wonderful blessing that came it had no plan attached to it, but uh, but came out of the blue. Thank, no, thank you for sharing that. It is yeah. an awesome story. Um, so I want to dive into this. Um, this book is called A Graduate's Guide to Life. And, and in this, you say something that might be controversial. Because when, when students come to college, you're told, the next four years are going to be the best four years of your life. Make the most of them. And in this book, you say they should not be the best four years of your life. Yeah. Why not? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, I actually speak to uh, uh, groups of, of college students on a, you know, fairly frequently. And what I found, and this was even true for my daughter when she was heading off to college, um, for most of you, and I don't even have to ask you to raise your hands because I know what usually is the answer. I would ask college students, how many of you were told that these are going to be the best four years of your life? And almost everybody's hand goes up. And what's interesting is, you're told that by people who really love you, oftentimes, your parents or, or grandparents or people who care for your teachers. And they tell you that because they want you to go out with, with hopefulness and optimism and, and the world is your oyster and go out there and, and, and seize your potential and all those wonderful sentiments. Uh, but I thought to myself, wow, is that... Is college really supposed to be the best four years? I mean, do any of you want to peak when you're 22 and say for the next 60 years, you know, it's it just a slow decline into, into, into dull, mindless mediocrity? Of course not. And, and, and it got me to thinking. Um, I also think that, and, and, you know, that COVID has inhibited a lot of the socializing in college, but I think a lot of people get to college in that freshman year, they think of, well, I've been told that it doesn't get any better than this. This is the best four years of my life. I, I guess I better blow it out. I guess I better really live it up, because after this, it's all downhill. And, and as opposed to saying, wait a minute, I wonder if I might fashion my life where I'm thinking, is there a way that I can kind of have a continual, gradual ascent into greater and greater fulfillment into greater and greater happiness, into greater and greater, you know, the world uses the, the term success, and it also uses the word, ha the word happiness, but what we're really talking about is fulfillment of what God put you here for. And so, um, and I think it relieves some of the pressure of college. You, you don't have to figure everything out just right. You don't have to have the time of your life. You don't have to have everything be perfect. You know, there are high levels of depression in college. Because a lot of people say, well, I was told it was supposed to be the best four years of my life. And wow, and there's not a parade every day. So what, what's wrong? Uh, and so I want to I wanna take the pressure off of you. These don't have to be the best four years. I hope they're great years for you. I hope they're wonderful. But I hope your life keeps getting better every year. I think my life's better now than it was when I was in college. I had a great time in college. Last time I was there, we actually won the national championship. We hadn't done that in 40 years, but, but I had a great time when I was in college. But, but it's not, it doesn't have to be the best four years. I think college is a preparation for the next 60 years. So, elaborate on that. What would you say is the purpose of college or the purpose of education? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Dean Abella referenced that, that I've been involved in education for a long time. And one of my favorite definitions of education by a German liturgist, Joseph Youngman. He says, education is the process of introducing a person to reality. And I'm, I'm fascinated with that concept of reality. Um, we, we all say, oh, I want to be grounded in reality, but, but many times we don't. 
Um, it's amazing how many people my age know they're supposed to go in for some medical test. They just keep putting it off, right? <laughs> Why do we put it off? Oh, I'm sure I'm okay. Yeah, well, then go get the test and you'll know you're okay. We don't want to get the test results because we're afraid of reality. You guys are afraid of reality. We're all afraid of certain realities. T.S. Eliot, in one of his poems, said, you know, humankind can only bear so much reality. We get very nervous about reality. Um, but but I, I do believe uh, there's, a, there's a great philosophical writer of the 20th century that if, you, if you've never heard of him, his name's Joseph Pieper, uh, P-I-E-P-E-R, and he writes a lot about prudence. I think part of what you're here in college to do is learn how to make prudential decisions for the rest of your life. If you can, if you can, so, so, and, and so what you want to do is say, well, what goes into making prudential decisions? And Joseph Pieper says one of the first things is to see things as they really are. Because imagine, if you, don't, if you don't get the right data to begin with, how can you make the right decision? If you don't know what time the plane leaves the, the airport, how in the world can you get there on time? You need the right, you need the right information. You got to see things as they really are. But it's hard. And so I think the first part of what you want to do here is to say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to look at things as they really are. We're trying to see without the blinders that society puts on us, we get shaped into so many conceptions of, of the way we're supposed to see the world. Um, and you know, there might be secular people who would say, well, if you're, if you're so tied to reality, what's with all this Catholic <laughs> religious mythological stuff? And the fact is, I think it's the greatest reality. Reality is not just tied to things that we sense with our five senses. I mean, you know, love cannot be smelled or tasted or felt or, or heard. Okay? It's, it's not, but there is love. I know there is love. That's a, love is a reality. And so I think one of the benefits you have at a, at a place like Catholic University is you get to get all the reality in your education, not just the scientific realities, not just the artistic or, 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 or you know, when we think of the liberal arts, not just those, not, not just the political science realities. You get to get all the, all the realities. And that's what leads to a, to a good preparation to be prudential the rest of your life. So, yeah, I think the purpose of being here is to figure out how do I gain some wisdom and how do I learn how to make good decisions? You figure out how to make good decisions, you're made. I don't care what degree you have. You figure out how to make good decisions, you're going to be in, in, in rooted in a foundational faith. You're going to be fine. And I'm not, I'm not being Pollyannish. We live in very difficult times now. I know that. Live in challenging economic times, challenging political times. It's a it's a challenge on many fronts. Um, but 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 when you're thinking, okay, what's the thing I want to leave with here? When when, when I leave Catholic U, and one of the things you want to think about is how do, how do I know how to make good decisions? Is there a way to actually cultivate that and practice that? Is there a way to learn that? Is there a way to learn how to make good decisions? Because if there is, you want to get about doing that. Because uh, it's going to hold you well for the next 60 years. So, so this is a business school. When people talk in business about getting ahead. Yeah. So in your book, you have some harsh things to say about the phrase getting ahead. And you draw this distinction between human competition and animal. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, because I like this idea of studying reality, um, oftentimes when I'm looking at human beings and trying to understand what's going on, I turn to biology. Um, because we are animals. We are mammals. Everybody in here is a mammal. And if you want to understand, sometimes the way you want to understand human mammals is study the other mammals. Study the ones that are closest to us. Okay? Animals compete. Animals compete for water, for food, and for sex. And sometimes safe safe places, but they, they compete for the things that they need to have to survive. And we have those animal instincts in us. But we're also human beings. And so the question is, how do we be mindful of the fact that we have this animal instinct in us that says, I want to have dominance over that other person. I want to get ahead. So we, we have that drive 
It pushes us. It's not a bad thing. Competition's competition is sort of like sex in that it is not. It, it is a good thing, but it is a thing that is often abused by human beings when they're not mindful of the goodness that's there. But the very first murder in the history of mankind happened because one brother wanted to get ahead of the other one. One brother was jealous of the other one. Okay? And, and, and Cain's thinking, well, my, my, my sacrifice is not as, not as honored as Abel's is. I'll take care of that. That's the worst form of competition. That's how animals compete. Interestingly enough, human beings have known this for a long time. That's why the Greeks had the Olympics and they had these rules about sports. We're going to have, we're going to have competition, but we're going to elevate it. That's why the Olympics used to only, only allow amateurs. We think of now an amateur as somebody who's not all that good at something. An amateur means somebody who does it because they love it. They love the activity itself. And what do we, so, so then the question becomes, well, okay, why do we want to compete? What, what, what's the good served by it? The good served by it is that it brings out the best in us. I'll never forget, years ago, Tiger Woods was in, a, uh, in the finals of the PGA Championship. And it went to, I'm sorry, finals, final round, and then it went to a playoff, full hole playoff. If you don't play golf, and that's sort of follow me here for a minute, but you, you go one hole at a time to see whoever wins the hole, they win the championship. And so Tiger had rolled in a really long putt, and the other guy was waiting to putt over his really long putt, and he made it. And later, Tiger ended up winning, so they were interviewing him afterwards. And they said, when, when your opponent, when Bob May was lining up that putt, it would have tied Tiger. They asked him, what were you thinking, Tiger? He said, I was hoping he'd make it. The, the reporters were kind of flabbergasted. Are you kidding me? Did you not want to win? Tiger said, of course I want to win. But you want the other guy to invest. It was, really, it was really a moment where you think, yeah, that's the purpose of competition. So I like to play golf, and I've now learned I'm doing better when I play golf when the other guy's hitting a shot. If I truly think to myself, and let's say he's lining up to putt the ball in the hole, I'll say to him, make that putt. You can do it. And I, and I, and I, I mean it sincerely. And I found it, it elevates me. It makes, me. it makes me a better person. As opposed to thinking, boy, I hope he misses it. And as a part of the animal in me, it kind of wants him to miss it. Yeah. That's the animal. The human says, no, I want him to make it. Because the purpose of the competition is not for me to have dominance over him. How does that play out in the business world? I'll tell you how. I've been in business with my brother, two years, two years younger brother. We've been friends since he was born, 57 years ago. I've been in business with my brother for 32 years. When my brother and I play golf, we don't even keep score. We're just brothers. We just enjoy being with one another. So we, competition can be there, but I think we have to be very mindful of it. And, uh, and I guess one final point I'd want to make to you is um, there's a sense that the only way we're going to be happy in life is somehow if we win things. And candidly, the academic world sets us up for that. So bright young people throughout the world compete in the classroom. Oftentimes there's a bell curve. There's only going to be so many A's in a class, which means it's a zero-sum game. Only so many people can win. Well, guess what? Like in, if one day you want to be a good husband or wife or father or mother, there's no, there's no bell curve. Okay? If, if you decide you want to be really good at that, you can be, even if your neighbor is, even if everybody else in town is a good spouse or a good parent. You can be too. It's not a zero-sum game. And so what I try to look for in business is where can I go where there's not so much competition? What business opportunities are out there where it's not dog-eat-dog -dog and, and I can have more abundance? Um, you know, I'll think of something I don't want to compete for. I don't ever want to compete for my wife's affection. Ever. Any competition fund? Not in that case. I got no interest. I want all of it. I want an abundance of her affection. I want an abundance of my brother's friendship.
I want abundance. I don't want to compete with, with, with other people for my brother's friendship. So, you know, again, I think as you go into the business world, you might be thinking, where do I think I might can create an abundance? And, and when you do get into a competitive situation, I just be mindful of the fact you don't want to lose your humanity. And it's real easy to do that because the world actually tells us the purpose of the competition is to win. The purpose of the competition is to win. And, uh, and, and I, think, I think we've lost sight of what our historical ancestors taught us about competition and how, because it, it, because it does have a little bit of the animal in us, we've got to be very careful and elevate it to a human level. Thank you for that. Um, so you, you, you've been successful as an investor, as a philanthropist. Um, there's something very interesting you say in the book about wealth which I think I know a little bit about money and stuff and business, you know, uh, that I've never ever seen anywhere before. And you said that there's a profound connection between wealth and hope. Yes. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I came upon that. I was trying to figure out, and, and it's kind of crazy. To me, 2008, 2009 was just the other day because it was a big financial crash. And, and I invest in, in the financial world, and so it just rocked everybody's world. I realize for y'all, you know, you probably in elementary school, okay? But let me tell you, 2008, 2009, 2010, the world got turned upside down financially. I mean, you know, big investment banks were going under. Warren Buffett had to give a loan to Goldman Sachs and to General Electric, okay, because they were concerned about whether they had enough liquidity on their balance sheet. They were concerned about their ongoing business. We're talking about the most successful investment bank in the world and one of the most successful industrial companies of all time. And they're having to go get loans at this time. And what happened is, you know, the stock market just crashed. And I remember hearing somebody say that in, that, that in this country, you know, around the world, that $15 trillion worth of wealth had been lost. $15 trillion worth of wealth has been lost. You'll hear that. If, you, if we have a stock market crash, which we may in the next year or so, or at least a dip, okay, you'll hear that you'll hear a trillion dollars of wealth was wiped out. Okay, so I thought $15 trillion of wealth is lost. Now, when I lose my keys, okay, when I go home and I lose my keys, they didn't vanish. I know they're there somewhere, okay? My keys are somewhere. When I lose a sock, when I lose something at my house, I know if I just, you know, okay, re retrace your steps, I'll find it. But this was, this was World Economic Organization saying $15 trillion of wealth is lost. Well, where is it? Did it fall into the ocean? Is it in a cave in Switzerland? Where is it? Did somebody lose it but somebody else got it? No, it's gone. It's gone. And I thought, well, how does wealth vanish? Now, I don't know how far along you all are in your in your business studies, but if you if you know for the average for, for a publicly traded company, okay, let, let, let's say it's a publicly traded company that's uh, traded for their market capitalization. The whole company's worth a billion dollars. In music, that company's worth a billion dollars because they have a certain number of shares of stock, and and they have earnings each year. And let's say that company has. 50 million of earnings every year. Well, people will pay more than $50 million for that company because they say, well, they're not just making the money this year, they're going to make it next year, next year, next year. So sometimes that 50 million that the company makes, they say, you know what, I think that company's not only going to make money going forward, but I think the amount of money they make each year is going to increase. So they're making 50 billion, I'll pay 20 times that amount because I think they're going to keep making money so that multiple you pay for those earnings is called the, 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 the PE multiple the price to earnings multiple of 20 so if you're making 50 million that means the company's worth a billion dollars right but what's that based on every company on the stock market has a PE and everybody's projecting they're going to make money in the future now if all of a sudden economic conditions get bad 
a company that traded at a 20 multiple, 20 times 50 million, I'm doing my math right, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. 20 times 50 million is a billion. All of a sudden people say, I'm not so sure they're going to do so well in the future. I think, they, I, I, think, uh, I think their earnings may go down. Well, all of a sudden, their PE of 20 goes to 10. And people say, well, they made 50 million this year, but I'm not sure they're going to make more than 40 next year and 30 the next year. I, I, I. All of a sudden, that company's worth not a billion, but 500 million. They lost half their, half their value. Where? Who's got it now? No one. It vanished. And what that shows is that company, the wealth of that company that vanished, it was based on the expectation of the future. It was based on the expectation of future earnings. Every single company on the stock market is valued based on expectation of the future. Now, one word for expectation of the future is hope. And what I realized is just as wealth can be dis can vanish, it can also be created. When great wealth is created, a Marxist who sees things only in materialistic terms, a Marxist says, well, if wealth was created, it must have been taken from somebody. And I'll tell you, no, wealth is created when people get more hopeful about a business because of innovation. And so just as wealth can be, can vanish, it can be created. But what's essential for wealth to be created is hope. If you want to start a new business, right, and you can't get anybody to believe in your future prospects, i.e. have hope for you, have hopeful expectations, you, you won't go anywhere. The first thing we got to do is have hope ourselves, have hope, have confidence in the future. And from a theological standpoint, hope, hope is basically a term for confidence in God's providence. Faith is a belief in God. Hope is confidence in God. And so part of what, the, part of the essential basis of wealth, and a wealth comes from an old English word, wheel, which means well-being. Okay? You're wealthy if you have a high well-being. Anybody with a lot of hope, you've got a lot of well-being. And let me tell you something. When hope disappears, that's what happened back in the big financial crash. When hope disappears, boy, financial values just plummet. Wealth plummets when hope disappears. Okay? When there's a couple that's going through a divorce, their well-being, I don't care if they're billionaires, I don't care how much money they have in the bank. I just talked to a buddy of mine the other day, I found out he and his wife are getting divorced. He doesn't feel good, she doesn't feel good, their kids don't, nobody feels good, nobody feels wealthy, nobody feels well. Because the hope is gone. And so, so that's why, and it's, it's just odd to me in trying to study where that $15 trillion of wealth vanished. It, I, it finally, through working the logic, came around to because the hope went away. But what that means is if you can, if you can embrace hope and cultivate hope, it's a source of wealth. I just think that's really profound. It's just an insight into wealth that I had never, ever seen before. Um, and uh, it's not just hope, though. There's another part that you talk about, the, the wealth, right? And that's, yeah. Yeah, and as I mentioned about the divorce just a few minutes ago. And by the way, we've all we've all been touched by that. I'm not divorce is a tragedy that happens to people. I'm not trying to condemn it. I'm just saying it's not a hopeful thing, right? And what we said people love to go to weddings is there's hope. Okay, wow, this couple may live happily ever after. Now, does anybody totally live happily ever after? No, but we are engaged when we go to a wedding. We're engaged in an exercise of hope. We're engaged in that when a new baby is born, when there's a baptism, when there's first communion, you know, all those sacraments, the, 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 the youthful sacraments we have, okay? There's always hope. And the fact that it doesn't, that the couple doesn't live happily ever after doesn't mean that the exercise in hope is futile, okay? But, but what I found was it's not just hope that leads to wealth. The other piece, because, um, I've, I've been around, I've, I've done business with a lot of different institutions and stuff. I've been around people who have just unbelievable wealth. I've been around people who are billionaires. 
And I tried to watch which of the billionaires are happy and which aren't. And, uh, you know, the ones who were happy were the ones uh, who, I, I tell you what, I haven't met a happy billionaire who's unhappily married, okay, or who's lonely. I just haven't. I, th I think we, we're designed for human relationships. And so when Andrew asked, what's the, what's the uh, Dana Bell asked, what's the other component of wealth? I think it's the, the relationships we have. Um, as you, I mentioned earlier, my brother and I have been in business for, for 32 years. Um, I was talking the other day to a, to a guy, he's an attorney of mine, and uh, you know, I met him when I was a freshman in college 40 years ago. These relationships I have are, are, are so deep. You can imagine if you just had a tremendous amount of business, business financial achievement, and you were lonely. Um, and you see that in business. I mean, that's one of, the, one of the challenges, I think, not just for business. It could be great musicians. It could be in, in any endeavor. Um, it is important to seek excellence, excellence in the world. But, but when we get too attached to that and, and we neglect our human relationships, we, we don't end up truly wealthy. We may get money in the bank. We may get achievements. But there are people who just decide, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make money or get an achievement or get this award or whatever it may be. Whatever it takes, I'm going to do that. But when they sacrifice their human relationships to do that, uh, they don't end up wealthy in the true sense of wealth. They, they, they're not happy because they're lonely. Um, you know, our faith teaches us God, God is not one person. Um, uh, you know, it, it, Three persons, one God. There's it, the very God we worship. There's a relationship there between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I've I've found that it is it is quite nice to have to have some business success that puts money in the bank. It just doesn't substitute for the for the human relationships in my life. Um, now, what's what really nice is when you can go into business with people who you actually do enjoy being around. And then you get you get this beautiful virtuous circle where you're 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 achieving and creating value in the marketplace with people you enjoy being with. I would be very cautious to any of you about uh, about going to work with people who you don't believe value human relationships. Uh, because it's it's it, it can be it can be toxic and it can be very damaging. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Pope Benedict once said, "Everything you see here on this earth, mountains, buildings, great works of art, whatever you factories, whatever you may see here on earth, one day it will all be gone. There's only one thing in this entire building, on this entire campus, that will be around for eternity, and that's the soul in each other." The only thing lives forever is the human soul. So one of the things I figured out about trying to be wealthy, and I thought, okay, if there's one thing you can invest in, all right, you, if ever you're investing in a company and you get paid a dividend, would you rather get a dividend for one year or five years? Five years. Five years or ten years? Ten years. I think when you invest in people, there's, there's like this supernatural dividend that goes forever. The human soul lives forever. It lives forever. And so that, that, that's one of the things I want to encourage you about is focusing on the human relationships you make. Because if, if you do that and you have hope, I, I've just seen it's also a very good way to build businesses and create value. Uh, but, but more important than that, I think it's, it's the way to be humanly wealthy. Thank you. I want to say, you mentioned marriage. I want to explore that a little bit further. Is that something, this is, unfashionable maybe even to ask, but is that something students at the undergraduate level should be thinking about, or is that something that you wait until after your career is established? Yeah, I uh, I think all of you ought to be, unless you feel like you have a vocation to religious life, I think all of you ought to be looking to get married. Um, that doesn't mean you all will get married. It doesn't mean that's an easy process. Um, all of society used to be oriented around saying, uh, 
people should get married because it's actually a not only is it the way societies are organized, it's not only the only way society lives, uh, but it can also be one of the most wonderful blessings in life. Um, I now find that the, the predominant ethos is um, you should not get married until you're, everything else is established in your life and then start thinking about it. And uh, I still don't have everything established in my life. I mean, I'm 59, and I, and I don't quite have my whole future figured out yet. I don't really have my whole present figured out. It's always moving around and shaking around, and I got lots of uncertainty. And, and I, I've never had things just sort of all nailed down and complete and ready. Uh, I think part of it is we've all, I mean, I'm, I'm, my parents were divorced, so we've all been touched either personally or with those we love by divorce. And so, in a way, the last thing in the world we want to do is make a big mistake. Um, but I, I think we're almost so concerned about making a mistake, and, I, you know, this is true for entrepreneurs, too. You, you don't want to make a mistake, but at the same time, if you, if you never venture out, um, and so I, I want to encourage you all, you know, I don't know that you find a better uh, place to potentially meet somebody than in college. Many of you won't meet somebody here, and you may meet somebody later. Uh, but I, after, after my faith, is the greatest source of joy in my life. Um, I'm not saying that everybody married feels that way, uh, but it is amazing, even, even for people getting divorced, Almost all of them are so thankful that they had children by the person they're getting divorced from because children, the children bring them uh, uh, joy. So I do think it's unfashionable. I'll tell you one other thing. Um, J.R. Tolkien told his son, his son got, got married, so he wrote a letter to his son. He said, son, let me tell you, the devil's going to come after you and he's going to say to you, okay, you pick the good one, but it, sure she's the right one. And how can you be sure? Did you try them all, right? And we have this idea, I better, I better go out with lots and lots and lots of people because I need to be sure. You, let me tell you something, you're never going to be sure? Never going to be sure? When I leave my house to go to the airport, I flew in here today, okay? So when I leave my house to go to the airport, I've lived in Atlanta all my life. There, there are 50 ways I could get to the airport. And sometimes I can almost get paralyzed because I know every route to the airport so well. And I'm thinking, okay, what time is it? Okay, it's 8.20. At 8.20, you don't go anywhere like that. You know, and I, I start analyzing how am I going to get to the airport. At some point I realize I'm going to be sitting in my driveway for 15 minutes thinking about the best way to get to the airport and miss the plane. <laughs> I need to get going. Okay? Now, when I get to the airport, did I take the perfect route? Probably not. There might have been another route where the light would have changed just at this moment and I could have I could have gotten there 30 seconds early. I don't know, but you know what? At some point I gotta get to the airport. And so at some point, what we gotta say in life is okay, I just want you thinking about this. Your your the degree you get, that's important. The spouse you pick, ooh, that's like here. You know, the first job you get, okay. All this other stuff, and the person you find to spend the rest of your life with. So my, my only, my only uh, suggestion is start being mindful of that. If you do well with that decision, and you're mindful, and you start thinking about it now, you start thinking about what kind of spouse do I want to be? Am I making myself into the kind of person who would make a good spouse? And am I looking for that kind of thing? Let me tell you something. I've met, like I said, I've met billionaires who were unhappily married, and they weren't happy. I've met people who did okay, you know, career-wise, but were happily married, and they, they, they're loving life. So this is the time to prepare for life. We talked about what college is all about. I think a lot of what college is all about is getting prepared for the rest of life. And I just can't think of anything more important that you ought to be thinking about. I'm not saying everybody needs to run off and get married. But but I am saying that certainly ought to be on your radar screen. And the reason I'm emphasizing it is 
I've spoken to a lot of folks who have gotten out of college and they're, you know, the parents will say to me, hey, would you talk to my son? Would you talk to my daughter? They just graduated, you know, they think about a career and this or that. And so, you know, I, I talk to them in my office. And at the end of it, I'll say, are you, are you looking for a spouse? And I say, oh, no, Mr. Chan, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to start thinking about that when I'm about 30. And I realize no one in their life has asked them that. Now, for most of civilization, that would have been amazing. You mean nobody? We, we, all these, all these bright young people, and we give them SAT preparation courses, and they go to camp for lacrosse, and they go to summer thing for this, and they go overseas to study this, and we, we teach them all this magnificent stuff. But when it comes to the most important decision of their life, we don't tell them anything, anything. And I thought, wow, we're, we're, we ought to at least mention it. So I hope I haven't troubled anybody by mentioning it, but we ought to at least be thoughtful about it and mindful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we talk about careers. We're talking yeah. about careers and vocation. Are they the same thing, different thing? Yeah, you know, I, th I, th I think, I think when people speak about career, I'm actually, I'm not entirely sure I know how to define that word. Um, if you would ask me what is my career, uh, I, I don't really know what to tell you. If somebody says, well, what do you do now? Um, I'm not crazy about that question either because there's a lot of stuff I do. Um, I'm more interested in when somebody says, who are you? Um, and I think that's one of the things you all want to be focusing about is what, what kind of person are you becoming? Um, but you asked a specific question. I'm getting a little vague. I would suggest that society uses the term career because the word vocation sounds either religious or it sounds like, uh, like vocational school where you mm -hmm. go learn a trade. Okay. And so colleges were kind of set up for the liberal arts, okay, and then you had vocational schools where people would go learn a trade. And candidly, I don't like that distinction. I mean, I, I think people who learn a trade, uh, they become, you know, uh, become an electrician, right, or a, a, a plumber or a uh, carpenter or these trades that you don't necessarily need higher education for. I think that's incredibly noble, the, the notion that, that somehow there's this distinction between careers that are achieved in higher higher education and vocations over here. And I think we're better off if we if we for a moment put the whole notion of a career aside. Like I said, I don't even, I don't even I don't know what my career is and I don't I don't really know how to define the term. And I don't know that when I die I want to be defined by my career. Uh, I think we ought to be asking ourselves, what is my vocation? And not think of vocation the way the secular world treats it. We should be saying, what is God calling me to? That's what vocation means. What are you called to? I think about my four grandparents, all of whom I knew pretty well. Uh, my, my grandfather died when I was younger, uh, a good bit, when I was, before I was 21, right? But, but I knew all four of my grandparents well. And, and the other day, because, uh, I've been thinking about this notion of career for, for the past few days, and uh, okay, what career did those four people have? I mean, each of those four, each of my grandmothers and grandfathers, continue to live in me today. It's funny. I don't know if y'all saw Hank Aaron died about a month ago. Okay, and Hank Aaron's from my hometown of Atlanta, and uh, I actually saw him break Babe Ruth's record, but I also saw him hit hit his 500th home run, which is for you who aren't baseball fans, any player who hits 500 home runs is a big deal. You know, as a little boy, when Hank Aaron hit his 500, and I remember being puzzled because I didn't know what all the to do was about because they're rolling out banners and they're stopping the game to, to celebrate it and all this kind of stuff. I hardly remember anything other than I'm sitting there with my grandmother and my grandfather because they used to take me to baseball games, right? And my grandfather was really into the game. He's he, he would keep the box score on the program and everything, but my grandmother would explain everything to me. You know, and when I think about Hank Aaron, the greatest of all time, okay, uh, I think of my grandmother. 
I don't know Hank Aaron had a career in baseball. What's notable is when he died, what they celebrated was what a good and decent man he was. What a humble and courageous and decent person he was to everybody. I mean, that's what the people in Atlanta, that's what everybody was, was talking about with Hank Aaron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He broke the blues record, but man, for the next 50 years, what a, what a good and decent person. I mean, his career, think about that for a, for a baseball player, your career is over when you're like 35. And you live another 50 years, right? Career is not actually what defined Hank Aaron. But notably for me, what I'm thinking about when Hank dies is sitting there by my grandmother. I don't know what her career was. I went to work with her for a few times. She worked in the auto repair shop and she got, ran the, you know, coded up the, the car repair bills for people. My other grandmother worked in a shoe store. My grandfather had a shoe store. My other grandfather was in the army for, I don't know what his career was. I don't know what any of them, I don't even know if they thought they had a career. They did have a calling though. They did have a vocation. So, again, I mentioned earlier about, about what you should be seeking in college and maybe what you don't have to feel the pressure about. I don't think you have to have the pressure about these are the four years when it's going to be the best in my life. I mean, you have to have the pressure, this is when i got to get it all figured out. You don't have to have the pressure of, i got to figure out my career. Because I haven't figured mine out yet. You know, i got a friend I'm going to be talking to later tonight, right? And he's, he's thinking, what, what's the next stage in my life, right? We, we have stages in our lives that are beautiful because they, they unfold in front of us and they have God's providence about them. And since we get wed into a particular career, and now it's this earthly thing that's got to have this stamp of approval from the rest of society, that's not what defines us. That's not what lives forever. My, my grandparents still live inside me, but it's not their career that lives in me. It's the fact that they answered this call to be good to one another, and to be good to their children, and be good to their grandchildren, be good to the people around them. That's why I still admire my grandparents, not because of the career they had. So don't feel like you got to figure out a career. Uh, what you do need to do is pray each day. Pray every day. You don't have to pray for a long time, but pray every day. Say, God, please, help me understand what you're calling me to. And then understand this. I'm 59, and every morning I still pray that prayer. Lord, please strengthen my mind and my soul that I may better discern your will for me and grow in closer communion with you. I pray that every morning. Because I still need direction. Because I still haven't figured it all out. I still don't have my career plans all settled. Because life's unfolding in God's providence. Let me ask you this. Um, you know that in, in the business school we focus a lot on virtue. I'm going to risk by asking you this question. Um, is virtue important, necessary for success? You said is it necessary for success in business? Um, you, you have to be good. Yeah, I, 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 I will tell you this, and, and I don't know what. <laughs> I, I I don't know that you have to be virtuous to to make a lot of money. Okay, because I think there are. I don't think you know. We started this evening talking about reality and being grounded in reality. I know people who aren't virtuous. Look, a, a cocaine drug lord can can make a lot of money. All right, and there's not a lot of virtue there. Um, so uh, I don't think, I, here's what I do think virtue is required, though, for. True success is not the guy who makes a lot of money. True success is the person who is wealthy, as we talked about it before, has hopefulness about their future, and is surrounded with human relationships that mean something to them. Now, for that, you've got to be virtuous. That can't be achieved without virtue. I mean, you've, you've got to be sacrificial. You've got to be humble. Um, these, are, these are difficult things. You know, one of the things we want to think about with virtues, and again, I think part of college, look, I'm, I still have to practice virtues. There's certain virtues. I try to pick different ones at different times that I pray for. Um, you know, I do a little bit of rotation, kind of depending on which one I think I need the most work on. The reason we talk about practicing virtues is never get it down perfect. You got to keep practicing. I have to practice virtues. 
And so one of the things I think you do want to do, I don't know if you have to have virtue to, to get a lot of money, but you do have to have virtue if you're going to have happiness in this life. So one of, the questions, one of the things you can start to do when you're in college is say, you know what, I'm going to work on a few. I'm going to work on a you know, pick a couple every month. These are the virtues I'm going to work on. Look, you can you can find find. I mean, it, Benjamin Franklin did this. He had a he had an entire program. You read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. He was intent. I'm going to teach myself virtue, and then you got to practice it. But this is a really good thing. Look, you don't get you don't get physically fit by just saying, well, I'd like to be physically fit. And we all know that. You, you, you have to work. And, and you can get physically fit and then stop for six months, and you're not physically fit anymore. It's, it's literally something that has to be done, you know, on a continual basis. And I think virtue is the same way. Um, you know, I, one of the real benefits of being at the, at, at the Bush School of Business here at CUA is, you know, there's a real emphasis on virtue. And, and you all, I want to encourage you, um, embrace that. If, if you could, I think it's important that you learn the time value of money and double entry accounting and, and statistical methods and, and, and marketing and all the things you'll learn. But, but handedly, if you didn't learn any of that, but you came out of here learning a whole lot of virtue, you're way ahead of the game. Way ahead of the game. Now, I'd, I'd like you to learn all of it, okay? Learn, learn the academic stuff and the virtue. If you gave me the choice of only one, I'd take, I'd take the virtuous person, because I figure they can learn anything later, okay? I'd take the virtuous person versus the person who's really learned but hasn't practiced any virtue. Because that person I can't trust. I can't trust. And if you can't trust, there's, there's no hope, there's no relationship, there's no nothing. Relieved to hear that. <laughs> We're not on the wrong track. So, um, I want to open up the floor to uh, students in the room and online. If anybody has a question, I don't think we need the mic. I think it would be okay if you just speak up loud. So, anybody have a question? Just raise a hand in the room or or put in the chat. Do we have one already? Go ahead. So, the first online question is: How, as college students, can we begin to instill the value of hope within our lives? That's I like that. Um, and one reason I like that is because hope is a, a bit of a mysterious virtue. We all kind of know what love is. Um, we we kind of know what faith is. We know what courage is. A lot of the other virtues, we, we have a pretty good idea. So how, do we, um, so how do we start to practice hope? So the first thing I would say is uh, I do believe with the first of any of these things, I pray for it. I said, Lord, um, I ask that you fill me with hope. You know what's interesting about prayers? Um, and I, I think I'm on solid theological ground here, but I, I stand corrected if I'm not. But I'll, I'll tell you what I've found. God, I don't believe God answers every prayer. But I do believe if, there, if you're praying for something that he, that, that he wants for you, he will answer that. I do believe he wants you to be filled with faith, hope, and love. I think when you pray for those things, God sends them. So the first thing I would say is I would pray for hope. And then one way to one way to practice hope, and this relates back to the relationships, okay, is to start is to start believing in other people and forming those relationships. Let me tell you something. We're all gonna be, and I say we because even though you're younger than me, I've still got years to live. We're all going to be disappointed by other human beings. It's, it's terrible, man. It, it's, it's shattering. It hurts. We'll be betrayed. We'll be let down. We'll be disappointed. All those things. But what you got to do is say, yeah, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate hope in other people. I'm going to continue to believe in them. I'm going to continue to step out there. And so that one of the ways I would... I would practice this virtue of hope and to say, I'm going to believe in other people. You know, and then even even little things like uh uh you know, a, a priest once told me, look, um, believe all the good you hear and only the bad you see. In other words, you hear something bad about someone else, just put it aside. Don't believe it. 
you don't you don't have to believe you can you can think the best of other people it's really easy to go through life cynically and all of a sudden if you're cynical and you're skeptical of everything boy the hope vanishes and so so i think it being hopeful is not just a matter of being optimistic it's not, it's not really that but it is a decision to act with confidence about the future but particularly about other people and that's part of this idea of, uh, you know, of thinking about getting married. I mean, um, you're going to, everybody in here who gets married is going to marry somebody who's going to disappoint them at times, is going to be very imperfect. Every single person who gets married will be married to somebody like that. Because every one of you is like that. And I'm like that. And yeah, we got to demonstrate hope. So I think you do it by, by, by really believing in others. Believing in God and then acting on it. You pray, that's confidence and hope in God, and then you invest in others and your human relationships with them, and that's showing hope in them. Any questions in the room? Yes. Okay, just so you, in yep. case you didn't hear, he said that at our company, how do we create a virtuous work environment? Um, primarily, so we, we don't have a huge, it, it, it's a, a relatively small investment company. Um, I'm sorry, I forget my glasses are behind the shield. Uh, I think primarily it is through example. Um, it doesn't mean that overt stuff is not good. So to have sort of a company code or this or that, um, can be helpful, and particularly for larger organizations, you know, where where everybody's not coming into contact with the guy at the top, if you will. I think you need more of those sort of uh, overt uh, mantras and things, okay? But but or, or, or codes and 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 uh, codes of behavior, if you will. Um, uh, what we found candidly is I, I got to demonstrate it because whatever whatever you may say or print out, okay, if you if you don't demonstrate it, and and over time, you know, one of the things I tell anybody who comes to work with us, and for this matter, anybody we're doing a deal with, and I really do believe this. I say, listen, the the relationships I really like, I like to do deals with people where. Um, I used to say for the next 40 years, I don't know if I'm going to be around for 40 years now, but I used to say I'd like to do deals with people that I'm going to be working with for 40 years. Uh, I say that for a couple of reasons. One is I, I, I believe it. Uh, two is I want them knowing how I intend to act toward them. And I also want to let them know I kind of want you to treat me like that, which means let's not act like we're, only, we're doing this one-time thing and we're seeing who can get the best of each other, right? Let, let's let's work together like we're going to work together for 40 years. And, and you know, when people see my brother and I work together, they can also look at that and say, well, these guys, look, they, and, and they'll see us argue, right? But they know we love one another. So um, I, at this point, our biggest attribute is I just have a lot of people in our company who have been around forever and have long-term relationships. And that right there is a demonstration of, of something. So... Uh, I do think if we were larger, we'd need a more explicit code. Uh, but I don't think those codes have to be real detailed. I think people look at the leadership at the time. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So he was asking, how do you, if you're going to have some financial success, how do you balance it and not neglect your family? Um, I, uh, I, I appreciate how you asked the question. I'm going to change one of the words. I don't think you balance it. Okay. I think you have to prioritize it. Um, I think we use the word now, we use the word balance on a lot of, in a lot of these kinds of uh, situations. You know, how do you balance, how do you balance your faith in your work? 
you don't balance it. Faith comes first. How do I balance my family and work, my work? I don't balance it. My family comes first. Yeah, certainly. So, so then you may say, okay, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. But, but that is important to say, because for a lot of people, they say, no, my career comes first. I mean, I remember when I was a little boy, my father got a, an offer to uh, a promotion, but he had to move, right? He just didn't feel it was the right time for our family to move. So he turned down the promotion because the family came first. So um, it may sound obvious, but I think that's the first thing is to say, you know. Now, for me, practically speaking, I tried to have a few things in my life where um, metrics, and they were they were not they were not uh, all that detailed. But like you know, uh, whether it was a making sure I had a date night with my wife. I actually have one daughter. We um, and so you know, once she got to be about fourteen years old, once a month we'd go out, right? And if I if ever I was more than a week behind on that, I thought, uh oh. oh you know, things are getting out of alignment, right? If I, it's like I'm not going to miss a birthday. And you could say, well, what if what if somebody were dying on the street and you had to miss a birthday? Okay, there, there can be some exceptions, okay? But, but there were just certain things that you got to measure and say, wait a minute, if you're skipping this, if you're missing this, okay, that's an indication of priority. Um, so, I mean, I will tell you, I, I have... Most of my life worked really hard. Um, uh, I think I think for most people, if they can cut some of the, uh, I think if you want to really put your family first and then have financial success, you probably got to sacrifice some leisure activities. In the, at the end of the day, you know. Uh, but but I don't believe in balancing it. I think the family's got to come first. And if that means that you don't make a, you know, you give up a little bit of financial, I think it's a good trade. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, what's your favorite nonprofit? Favorite nonprofit? Other than the Bush School. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of scouring my brain for that. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, yeah, uh, I'm really stumped like this, and I'm, I'm surprised because I've, I've given a lot of talks on philanthropy, and I study it a lot, and I've never really, um, I mean, I could give you kind of a trite answer, like, well, that's like telling me which of my children are my favorites, right? You know, it, it, it's not really um, that so much. Um, I'm, maybe it's because I think a lot of nonprofit work is, is actually very tough, and Sometimes the harder it is, maybe the more important that it is. But it doesn't necessarily give me fulfill, like, like it doesn't bring me satisfaction because the job's never quite done. Um, and that, that's okay uh, because I, I think if I'm called to it, it's then that's something I got to work hard at. I, I will say this. I, I guess if you, and I'm, it, I'm, I'm uh, meandering while I get my thoughts together, and it finally kind of came to me. If you don't know somebody, what they think about something, look at what they do. What they do is probably an indication of the answer. And what I tend to spend a lot of time on is education. And, and what I'm really focused on is Catholic education, I've, I've worked, you know, he mentioned the Presidential Commission on Education. I've worked on education on a broader scale. But Catholic education, because I think it's a complete education. It's the reality, not just of the earthly things, but of the transcendent things, too. So um, at the end of the day, my, my work with educational 
institutions because look that's where you can you can see people there's a there's a a, a, a spark that you can that, that can be lit in someone that they can carry for the rest of their lives and so there's a there's a K through 12 schools in Atlanta that I was involved with the founding of. And that was 25 years ago when it started. So the, you know, we've got lots of graduates now who are in their 30s, and I'm seeing the impact that that had on them. And I'm thinking, wow, that, 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 that changes people's lives. So, um, so I think it, it does bring some joy and consolation when you, um, when you see that, I guess I think of my nonprofit activity different than businesses because I don't really, if the success happens with a nonprofit, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, well, God did that. And I was, you know, fortunate to be alone for the ride. Uh, but I like being alone for the ride with Catholic education because I just think it, it does, it changes people's lives. Any others on that? Okay, okay, very good. Um, another round of applause, I think. Thank you. 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 Do you have a few more minutes before you leave? Pardon me? Do you have a few more minutes before you have to leave? So if anybody wants to talk to Frank one on one, just please come on down. Otherwise, yeah, you're all free about, to go. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, okay. right. Oh, one other thing. Um, we have a little gift for you. Um, I think you know this, Frank, but one of the faculty in the Bush School in his spare time translates the gospel. So we thought you would appreciate ah, one of the poems is his second book on uh, the Gospel of John. So wonderful. Thank you, you very much. Prologue in a new translation. Oh, that's beautiful. So, that's beautiful. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Good to see all of you.